we give your name the praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you. Hallelujah. Lord, we give your name the praise. Hallelujah. How many know his name is beautiful today? Hallelujah. How many know his name is awesome? Hallelujah. Lord, we praise your name.
while you wait, you still have to serve God. Hallelujah. You still have to worship him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Because he's an all-time God. Hallelujah. He's never late. Hallelujah.
the Lord told him, stand still, stand still. You're going to see it, just stand still. It's coming, you may be seeing it, okay? Stand still, it's coming. You just got to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I believe God. I believe his word. I believe God meant what he said and said what he meant.
and it's crept even into our church. Churches are trying to do any and everything just to get numbers in. It is a sad day. Of all that's going on, we need prayer. We certainly need to stand on the word of God. I believe we are closer than what show you something next week. I'll be deviating. We've been exploring the seven churches to uh, Asia as John was writing. Uh, next week we will deviate from that. I'm going to share a message, a Christmas message concerning prophecy of the Old Testament. I'm going to walk through the Old Testament and show you just how accurate God is. Over 30 writers didn't even know each other. Yet God connected the dots in such a marvelous way. From a prophetic lens, when you look at it all the way from the proto-evangelical perspective, when God made the declaration to the servant that the seed of this woman, that a woman don't produce seed, makes the seed of this woman. There's some theological questions that arise. We get that answer next week. Come. Bring some friends, family. You will be blessed. Last week I made a statement. And uh, I, uh, I want to show you something. Uh, not just to show this man. Because I mean, he's a household name. If anybody uh, follow on YouTube or anything. I mean his name just keeps popping up. Because it's just synonymous with who he is. And all of the things that follow with him. But the Bible said you would see such times unfold. Strange fire. Very, very strange and bizarre things are being done. Well, I mean, last week I made a statement about a pastor who resolved that he wants to sell weed in his church, grow it, and sell it to attract people. I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. I, I, everybody is talking about it, so we might as well talk about it. Somebody asked me this morning, she said, well, what are we going to sell? I said, I don't have nothing to sell. I don't have a thing to sell. I give you the power back, but then I pay it. I don't have a thing to sell. Y'all know how I feel about selling. We struggle financially because I don't want to sell. And I, I just, that's just me. But, but he, he, he made statements. It's very public. So I'm going to show you. Uh, go ahead and put it up, sweetheart. Uh, this pastor who decided this is what he wanted to do. Go ahead, uh, play it, sweetheart. I want you to hear this. It might take a minute for her to read it up. But... Hey, everybody, Sean here. I hope you're doing well. Yes, you read that title correctly, so let's jump right in. And special thanks to Blessed Forever for sharing this. If you aren't familiar with Jamal Bryant, he's the lead pastor at New Birth Missionary Baptist Mega Church in Georgia. I've never heard of this guy before, but after a quick search, there are plenty of videos on him being involved with many unbiblical things. So let's listen to this 40 second video, and then we'll talk about some of the issues. I'm looking for people that smell like weed. Is why are we not? raising cannabis. I'll be able to bring in black males. They're able to do it legally. Mm. I'm teaching them farming. Oh my God. I'm helping them to enhance the ecosystem. Black boy in bank here said, they want to weed at the church? Where do I join? Yes. I don't need no pamphlet for you. And there you have it. You don't need pamphlets to attract people because when they hear your church is growing weed, they're going to check it out. Now, despite weed being legal in Canada, and I think most of the USA now, this is using a worldly device to attract people. And in one sense, is no different than worldly churches singing secular music to attract people. And let's be honest, this is just wrong. Worldly things should not be used to entice people into knowing our God, who opposes those very things. And secondly, this substance has been a problem in many people's lives in the past and could cause someone to stumble. Romans 14 tells us that we should do nothing that may cause someone to stumble. 
Not to mention 1 Peter 5.8 tells us to be of sober mind and alert, not spaced out and goofy. So despite his reasons why this is a good idea to get more people to church, I think this is pretty messed up. But what about you? Please leave your thoughts in the comments below. And until next time, take care and God bless. Did you hear her? Wow. Ooh, wow. Excited. This is what he would choose to do. Folks, we need to pray. That is just one of many things that is happening. I, I, I will show you next week. They have now come up with the technology in these buildings that can house labs. And they can, they have artificial fetus and grow your baby in a lab. 400 babies per lab in mass production so that you don't have to go through the trouble of carrying your baby. I'm not making this up. You can genetically tweak your baby. You can call. You know how to put the right genetics for it all. Baby online, order it. And follow the growth on the app. I'm not making this up. They say in 10 years, this is ready to move forward. All it takes is somebody with millions of dollars to say, all right, I want to hurry up and put this in place. And folks, you got people out there with billions of dollars that's willing to put it towards some ungodly practice like this. Something is happening. Something is happening. And anytime you see a church like this, and there are many others, I can I can spend all day showing you different clips on YouTube with some of the nonsense that's out there. I mean, one church, that, whether they come to a service, it's a circus. The stage is set. The clown, the preacher is dressed up like a clown. And they got different little skits, circus skits, and the elements. Somebody's swinging in the air. And they got thousands of people ground into it. No hearing the gospel no more. What this man just said, the gospel don't work no more. We need to come up with some worldly way. That strange fire. Amen. The day the gospel don't work is a sad day in the life of somebody because they are brought into Satan's life. Folks, we might not ever get to that status where we have a lot of people. I've been long delivered from trying to have a lot of people. But what I am adamant about is that a people with no God and know the responsibility and who God is and how we must live in light of that. That's our obligation. I can't believe it. But the drama that follows from this church and there's thousands of people, I mean, Thousands. They got buildings so big. And you heard him say they own more land than any other black church in Atlanta. Now don't you think we can grow corn? My Lord, you get a herd of chicken. <laughs> we can really help people out. Teach them how to grow chicken and lay eggs. If you want to do something productive, let's get some chicken leaves. Show them how to grow them babies. Your mom used to get in the mail one. Huh? Let's do that. Grow some watermelon, something we like. We, I've been delivered. I smoke drugs. I'm not saying this in brag, but I smoke drugs. I've been delivered from that. When my tooth hurt and they try to give me some oxycodone, I don't want it. I don't take it. I won't take that prescription because I don't want to go back to the edge of what I used to do. I've been delivered. I know that struggle. You're going to bring that into the church. I know that struggle better than a lot of people and the other people in here know what I'm saying. Who the sun set free is free. Free indeed. How dare you? On what authority? You notice he didn't have no scripture to support that. He had to just throw that out. There's no verse you can bring up with that. He's being rebuked. Thankfully, thankfully, even though the elders at Newburgh won't take him down. But he's being reviewed openly, and a lot of people have made their comments about this in disgrace. I tell you, the minute I say something like that, somebody here ought to say we're looking for a new pastor. Yeah. Somebody here ought to have enough guts to say, all right, if we can't get a new pastor, I'm gone. Yeah. New words should be empty by now. And people should be looking for somewhere where God is one more time speaking to his people. 
children of Israel came out of Egypt, they were moving toward God and the holiness was required. Each step was a step of heights of holiness and they had to put off that old stuff. They had to be reminded that they can't practice any of that stuff they saw in Egypt because the Lord said, I am the Lord your God and you should have no other gods before me. These are just tip of the iceberg. The Bible said this you know. In the last place, these times are here. If you're still hanging out on the wind, your redemption draw up now. And I believe it is closer than ever before. How would man decide he's going to get a laboratory and produce babies by the hundreds? What kind of game are we playing here? The only thing holding them up in Israel, those Jews who don't believe in Jesus are still trying to build a temple. They got their pure white lamb. They're ready to do their blood sacrifice. And I just found out there's a new religion they're trying to form called Christendom. Christendom, I can't say it. Catholics, Muslims, building a, a, a temple in Dubai. A lot of money. And it's going to have all these three religions merged together because, you know, we want peace. The Bible said there'll be no peace until the Prince of Peace come. So all that peace you're looking for, you're not going to get it by compromise. The only peace you're going to get is just stay with him. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. He said, I'll keep you in perfect peace. Speed on me. What Daniel did in a faraway land was take a stand. He knew what was signed, he knew what was declared, but he took his stand. God gave him peace to do it. And a grace shut the mouths of the line. They're coming for you, but there's an amazing grace that's going to come. As I pray for you and you pray for me, we pray for this pastor. It's one thing to condemn a man, but Lord, let's take time now, y'all, while we're praying. Pray for him. Because he is lost. Let's just say what it is. He's lost. He don't know the God of the Bible or the Bible of the God we serve. He's disconnected from the two. God can, and only God can, turn his heart. And the heart of the king is in his hand. I pray that God will touch him, touch that leadership, touch that congregation who's just swallowing and laying in mud to the point they don't mind such nonsense. I pray that there would be a clearing call, that they would wake up and realize the error of their way. It's amazing that this has unfolded. We've been going through the seven letters to the seven churches and even the letter today speaks in reference to this kind of nonsense. But you're here, and we need prayer. Some of you is coming up on this time of year, and your heart is heavy. Loved ones are sick, you are sick. Financial situations, children not saved, all kind of drama. You're standing on the word of God in the midst of it all, and you need strength. Don't kid yourself. This battle is not yours. It's the Lord. You can't fight it in your own strength. The Lord said, without me, you can do absolutely nothing. So, Lord, we need you. We need you to show up in our situation. We need you to touch these sick bodies that can't get well. We need you to regulate these minds that are out of control. We need you to move in the situation that has haunted us. And only you can do it. So, Father, as we come now and call upon you, we look to the hills from which come our help. Some trust in horses, some in chariots, but we, we look to you, Jesus. We call on you, our great Redeemer, our El Shaddai, our Jehovah Jireh, our Jehovah Enkidesh. We look to you. You are everything. Even if we don't know it in any fancy term or any kind of colloquial way to put it, Father, we need you. We need you in our homes. We need you in our marriages. We need you in our church. We need you with our children, Lord. Oh, God, we need you on these jobs, Lord. We need you in this time in which we live. 
with the depraved, unregenerated heart is showing just how far it's willing to go to show its blasphemous way, to show its wickedness, Lord. It is a volatile time, Lord. We are living in times of peril, Lord. Great peril. But, oh God, our eyes are upon you, and we ask that you would do as only you can, Lord. Give us the peace of God. Give us the mind of God, Lord. Show us each and every step we must take. Show us each and every way we must go, Lord. Your word declares that steps of good men are ordered by you, God. And we need you to divinely order our steps. Move us in the way we should go, Lord. Move us in the paths of righteousness, God. Oh, my God, my great Redeemer, Lord. You are the healer of sick bodies. You are the restorer of messed up minds, Lord. You are the regulator of our heart, Lord. You can take the means. Lord, help me to be a better man, Lord. Help me to be a better woman of God, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord, pour out all on us, Lord. We need a fresh anointing, Lord. Not a feeling that come over us and go, but we need power in this day. We need power from on high, Lord. 
Pastor was right. He really already most of the message that I had for you this morning. But that in and of itself is the way the Holy Spirit often works in our lives. Yes. 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 So let's take a second. Let's quiet ourselves. Yes. And really let the Holy Spirit move. Let's open up our hearts this morning.
with me, if you will, to the book of Revelation, starting in chapter 3. Give you a quick second. This morning, we're talking about a church. background on the city of Sardis. Sardis was one of the oldest and most important cities in the area known as Asia Minor. Located near the modern day of the city of Sart, which is believed may have actually gotten its name from the city of Sardis, in what is now known as Turkey. It was centrally located in the midst of the seven churches that were mentioned here in the book of Revelation. It was approximately 30 miles southeast of Thyatira and about 48, 48 miles due east of Smyrna. It was once the capital of the nation known as Libya. The Pactolus River runs very near unto the city. And this river itself is very full of gold, making Sardis one of the wealthiest cities in its day. It was also one of the first cities to begin fashioning coins out of gold and silver. Because of its wealth of the gold and silver that it had access to, Because of where it was located, there were many trade routes that came through the city, making it one of the largest centers of trade 
in its time. They traded wool and very expensive dyes because they had them there in abundance. It is believed that the name itself was derived from the great Sardis stones or sardine stones as they were sometimes called. The stone was commonly called in their day the bloodstone because it was deep red in color. It was found all throughout this region. It's often actually mistaken for the ruby. This stone was one of the 12 stones that were set in the epoch that was given to the high priest of the children of Israel. And it was actually a representation of the tribe of Reuben. The climate of Sardis was beautiful for most of the year, either having very hot summers or very cold winters. There was, in the 6th century B.C., the city was known to be home to Aesop. Anybody here remember his stories of Aesop, Aesop's fables? Mm -hmm. He wrote stories such as the tortoise and the hare, the wolf in sheep's clothing, and the goose that laid the golden egg. The service was also the center of worship of a goddess by the name of Sadat. She was considered to be the mother of all the Roman gods. I want to make notice, I want to take note of something that's very important. This church, this church was never under much of persecution. They were never persecuted for not worshiping Caesar. Now it's not really clear as to whether they did worship Caesar or not. But they weren't persecuted. I think that's important. The Jews were not slandered here in the city of Sodom. Christian church here was completely untroubled from without and from within. Yes, there was peace in this city. There was peace in the church. A peace that wasn't felt in other churches at this time. But that peace was the peace of one Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. He starts off his letter. And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things say he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou Sardis was the fifth of the seven churches that John was writing to. And he started each and every one of his letters the same, addressing it to the angel of the church. And that word angel literally means messenger or pastor. These things, he said, he had, these things say he that have the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. In the beginning of the book of Revelation, John has a vision of Jesus Christ. And he records it down as he records what he saw as he's writing, starting the letter in Revelation chapter 1. We can only now imagine the magnitude of what he actually saw. 
For I believe it's almost impossible to truly write down every small little detail. And just like other provisions given in Scripture, it was just but a small taste of the fullness that is the glory of God. And words could never truly describe it. For the glory of Jesus Christ is greater than anything any of us could ever possibly imagine. We'll see it one day. For now, we just have to take the descriptions that were given to us. But there were several characteristics that Jesus, characteristics of Jesus that John wanted to bring to the forefront in his vision. Each having a special meaning. And each, given separately to the seven churches, was an aspect of Christ that was revealed from his vision and reference. In the letter to the church of Sardis, the aspect of the vision that was revealed to him was he who had the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. In Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 4 is where this was referenced. It says, John, and to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits, spirits which are before his throne. As the book of the Revelation began, John made sure it was understood that the words that he was speaking may have been written by his hand. But they came from a higher power. They came from Jesus and from the seven spirits, as he called them, which were before God's throne. Sardis was the only one of the seven churches that this was referenced back to. The address of the seven spirits only shows up in four places in Scripture. All of those are in the book of Revelation. And it's common, it's a common thought that he mentioned seven spirits because there were seven churches that he was referring to. Seven has always been said to have been the number of completion in Scripture as we see it often in that context. But I want you to see something else. Go back with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 11. Starting there in verse 1. We know that this is one of the scriptures written in Isaiah of a reference of Jesus Christ and who he would be on this earth. He says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear. fact is, there are seven spirits that are pointed out right here in reference to Jesus. These seven spirits show forth the complete work of both Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And we're going to take a few minutes. We're going to go through them real quick. Number one is the Spirit of the Lord. That word Lord there is in all caps. That's the name Yehovah, or the self-existent or eternal one. We pronounce the name Jehovah now. And this is the Jewish national name for God. It was the name that they used when they wanted to be very intimate with the Lord. It was a personal name that they had. This is a representation of the very nature of Jesus Christ. 
Secondly was the spirit of wisdom. That word wisdom is kahokma, meaning wisdom in a good sense. And that's the ability to make good and right decisions. Number three was the spirit of understanding. That word understanding in the Hebrew was be not, meaning perfect knowledge. That's the ability to understand that which is difficult to understand. Number four was the spirit of counsel. And that Hebrew word counsel is I saw, meaning advice. By implication, it means to plan out or to have prudence. And that's the ability to give good and wise counsel or advice. Number five was the spirit of might. That word might is gav ura in the Hebrew, meaning force, either literally or figuratively. figuratively. By implication, it means that it is valor or victory. It implies those things. And this is the ability necessary to do the will of God. Number six was the spirit of knowledge. And that word was da ah, meaning coming. It implies the ability to know beyond human comprehension. And the last thing that I fear one of I, I, I use the word fear because it's coming up. It was last in reference, but I think it was one of the most important was the spirit of the fear of the Lord. That fear is year off, meaning morally to reverence. That's the ability to respect and reverence our Lord God. Does that not perfectly and completely describe the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ? And the ministry of the Holy Spirit has in our lives today. John wanted the people of Sardis to know if this letter wasn't from me. It was from him who had the seven spirits of God and held the seven stars in his hand. And those seven stars we know is in reference to the seven pastors of the seven churches. As it's explained in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20. It says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, the seven and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the seven angels of the, and of, the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. In his right hand, he held the seven stars. Let us not overlook the fact that yet again in Scripture there's a reference to the individual bright lights that are in the midst of darkness. That was the representation of what the pastors were supposed to be over these churches. Calling these men who are the heads of the churches stars as they're supposed to be shining bright for our Lord. Amen. Nor should we overlook the fact that these churches are referred to as candles. And as we are here to shine the light in the dark places of this earth, and as this earth is getting darker, and it's getting darker by the we should be shining all the brighter for our Lord God. Mm -hmm. Have you ever asked yourself why he's holding them in his hand? He holds them to protect them. To give them the might in which to do the work which was placed before him. 
Also to show that he has authority over them. To direct them. And if needed, to move them. Or in some cases, to remove them. And set up another who would glorify him. He needed to remind the church in Sardis that this is from the one who holds the people and the pastors in his hand. And then he gets to the meat of what he has to say. He says, I know thy works. That thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. In verse 3. I know thy works. He knows their toil. They lack of work. Or the words. You didn't use the word sloth. As it was currently referred to in these days. No. He said I know your work. I know the things that you're doing. This church was busy. This church was involved with doing many works of the Lord. Or so it would appear. You can fool many, but you can't fool God. The church of Sardis, they could put on a show. They had it down. They were busy doing much. And they looked good doing it. They had a name that they were on fire for God. Said, Thou hast a name that thou livest. But he said, Thou art dead. If anyone can say from an outward appearance that there was a church in Asia Minor, Asia Minor that was on fire for God and it was the church of Sardis they were alive but the one who knows the hearts and can see past the face smiles and the word for self rather than the word for God said you have a name that you are alive but you're not you look like you're on fire, but there's no heat. Your lamp was the size of a lighthouse, but there would not have been so much as the light to draw a fly. There are churches like this all over the world. As we were talking about just this morning. Huge churches. A lot of people going about doing many things. But it's all for show. It's all for profit. They are not doing it for God. I pray against that spirit here in this church. I do not believe that it's here. But if we're not careful, it can very easily manifest itself. I want for all of us to be involved in a great work. That's my prayer for heart to heart. But I would rather be part of a church that from the outside seem like a small work for God. Though there are no small works for God. But from the outside, look like a small work for God. Then the church is doing a great work any other reason. The word dead they used here in the Greek was nekros. The church was dead. Well on its way to body. But it was not without hope. In verse 2 he said, Be watchful and strengthen the things that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Be watchful. 
This word means to keep awake, to be vigilant. His cry to this church was to wake up. Keep your eyes open. It's the same thing that Jesus Christ told his disciples that night in the Garden of Gethsemane. Right before his crucifixion. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. Then cometh Jesus unto them unto a place called Gethsemane. And saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray on you. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And he saith unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye, tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep. And he saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I love this spirit. It shows to us both that Jesus was 100% God, but he was also 100% man, which he has to be, to be able to die the death that he had. Jesus knew the path that was before him. The flesh fought against him. Just as our flesh fights against us, only he showed that we are capable of winning that fight through him. John's cry today was to keep your eyes open. Don't fall asleep. Watch and strengthen those things which remain. The things that are already on their way to die. For these works, that are not quite dead. They're not perfect before God. Going on to verse 3, he says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. And if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not Jesus was saying to this church was remember. That is to exercise your memory. Remember, he said, how thou hast received. Remember how thou hast heard. Remember who you are and where you came from. Remember how you received salvation. Remember how you heard and think on these things. He said to them, hold fast and repent. That term hold fast is one word in the Greek. It's tare, meaning to guard from loss or injury. By keeping your eyes upon it. Mm -hmm. Jesus was telling this church to hold to it. To guard it. To keep your eyes on it. And don't let it move. Mm -hmm. And to repent of their going on. If we can keep our eyes on the things of the Lord. We're not going to be keeping our eyes on the filth of this world. Mm -hmm. The 
things that will break our hearts and keep us in the flesh. No, he said change your mind as to how you're looking at these things. And look at me. Admit that you're wrong. Agree with God. And hold on to it. Maybe that's one of us here today. Maybe we've been living this Christian life for show. Maybe the love that we once had for God has grown cold. Nigh unto death. Maybe you too are closely walking away. Jesus asked them to remember what he has done. Cling to that. Mm -hmm. Repent of the ways that we've been living. And come back to him with all of your heart. He said that if you don't, here's my warning. I will come on thee as a thief. Thou shalt not. He warned them that if they didn't watch, if they didn't keep their eyes on him, they wouldn't know the hour that was coming. I don't know about you, but I want to see the presence of the Lord as he comes down from the glory. I want to be watching and waiting and ready. I know it's been said for years, but the time truly is getting close. A lot closer than people want to think. And while I'm waiting and looking, I want to be a doing of work that's going to glorify him. For in the end, if we truly believe what Scripture says, in the grand scheme of things, there's only two things that matter. Jesus Christ and the souls of men. That's it. And that, that needs to be the focus of every member of every congregation that is true unto the Lord. That needs to be the focus of everyone who calls themselves a Christian. In verse 4, he says, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. There's a, there were a few that were still there that were holding fast to the Lord. There were a few that were waiting and watching. It was said of the Hebrews that holiness was the garment of the soul. And the sin that somebody would commit would stain that garment. There were still those who were in sorrows that would not allow sin to stain them. Just as there are a few churches today that have not given themselves over to the filth of this world, who have not allowed God to simply become the means by which they could get rich. Or the means where they will become a symbol of status. They're out there. And we need to be careful what we read and what we watch and what we listen to. Amen. Under the guise of being a church leader, they teach false doctrine. Something that sounds good. And they manipulate scripture to try to prove their point. Because let's be honest, you can make the word of God say whatever you want it to if you take the scripture out. 
take nothing for granted. But read it for yourselves. Don't just read the verse. Read the chapter. Find out what they're saying, where they're coming from. Find out what it means. Get to the root, the definition of the words. For with time, as short as it is, we cannot afford to be wrapped up in what's false. Let it be said of us that there's a few names in St. Augustine which have not defiled their garden. But are living in the spirit, worshiping the, the, the true and living God. Thank you, Lord. That we too may walk with Him in white. Amen. That is to walk with Him in an unspotted garment. One that would win, one that when God looks into our lives, He may see us as He saw David. In Acts chapter 13, verse 22. Just after, he's telling the story of just, just after when Saul was removed as king. It says, and when he had removed him, he raised up unto him, them David to be their king. Amen. To whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, Amen. a man after my own heart, Amen. which shall fulfill all. Or is that not the purpose of our lives? To fulfill the will of God? We can only accomplish this if we're walking with Him in those unspotted garments. Not giving ourselves over to the vile afflictions that are in this world. Mm -hmm. That word walk <clears throat> means to walk at large. Especially as a proof of ability to live, to follow as a companion, to go with or to occupy with. He's saying that we are to follow closely with Jesus as, a, as our companion. And we know that we cannot walk with God and the Lord. Does it go to you? God said that there were a few here that have not defiled themselves. And that acting like a child of God that they are. But see this. That's not where you love. He said to he that overcometh, in verse 5, the same shall be clothed in white for him. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. That was the olive branch that he was using to reach the others. There were a few here who have not. That he that overcometh. That word overcometh means to conquer, to prevail against, to get the victory. To him that subdues. To him that overcomes this mess. He was reaching out and saying, if you stop doing these things and just live like you're called to, then whosoever does shall, I like that word shall. That word is a promise. He says, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. The same as the ones that had not defiled themselves. Jesus will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Going so far as to say, I will confess his name before God and his angels. This he says, he ends the same way as he has to the other churches. He says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit say to the churches. Stand with me as I close. 
He was reminding them to those who really want to hear the Lord God. He that hath an attentive ear to listen, let that one yes. hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Dear brethren, let us not grow weary on the sin. But let us keep our eyes open clinging to the hope of our salvation, watching and focus on God and He alone as we say, see the day draw on ever closer. And on that beautiful day, as He opens the sky and all see His glory and we are ushered up to meet Him in the air, let Him find us faithful Thanks again, brother. I love you.